Yep. Okay. Well, I think we're we're ready to get started. So, um, I'm just going to give a brief intro on Dr. Catherine Romanek. She's an environmental geochemist, and she's with the Gulf Coast Carbon Center at the University of Texas at Austin, and also the uh, the Bureau of Economic Geology. Uh, Dr. Romanek has been working for on carbon capture and sequestration for the last 15 years, researching geologic storage of CO2 and other issues. So I'm going to turn it over to her. I probably missed, she's got quite the impressive resume. I probably missed some things, but uh, thank you for being here today, uh, Dr. Catherine. Thank you all so much. I, I'm i thinking that you're seeing my big screen. We can see it. Great, thank you. Oh, and if I could ask everybody to mute themselves so we don't get any background noise. Great, thank you. So yeah, I, thank you so much. I am really excited to be here to talk about the pros and cons of CCS. And I wish uh, that you know we were all in the same room uh, and that I could hear more from you all, but hopefully we'll have time for that in the discussion uh, session. But uh, thank you so much for having me today. It's, it's a real pleasure. And um, so what I'm gonna do then is I'm going to talk I'm gonna do a little bit of introduction and scene setting. I'm gonna talk about the basics of CCS and then bring in some potential pros and cons. We'll touch on the safety, the cost, the viability of the technology, and then hopefully we'll have time for a discussion and quiz. Sorry, I left that out. <laughs> and yes, I am from the University of Texas at the Department of um, Bureau of Economic Geology at the Texas State Geological Survey. So we actually are the State Geological Survey for Texas. And you see our mission there below to serve society by conducting objective, impactful geoscience research on relevant uh, energy, environmental, and economic issues and to inform people about that. So thank you for the opportunity to do that. Uh, within that is the Gulf Coast Carbon Center. We conduct studies mostly on geological storage, and you see we have a very large international and interdisciplinary team, including um, international research fellows, students, and postdocs. And we work with emitters, we work with regulators and policy developers, and we work with environmental NGOs. So what I'm seeing right now is a lot of misinformed opinion on climate change. Things seem to be going a little bit crazy with people um, just kind of coming up with all of this stuff and all of this, all of these opinions. And so how are we going to wade through that? You know, how are we going to really know what is information we can trust and what is maybe just, like I said, rhetoric. Um, there's a lot of energy being put into the space. And yet we want to make sure that we are informed and we and we have an opinion that is informed. So I think what we do is we start with what we agree on, which is that we have a climate emergency and we need climate action now. And we don't have a lot of time. Time is ticking. We need to get rid of fossil fuels. We need to transition away from fossil fuels. We need to do it in a just and equitable way. And, um, and so we, we all, I think we pretty much all agree on that. How are we going to find the information that we can use to understand these technologies? Well, I think a great place to go is the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, hopefully you all know about this. I think you probably do, but it is the main international treaty to combat climate change. And in this framework uh, are 197 parties or countries, and they meet yearly at something called the COP, which is the Conference of the Parties. And we've been doing this now since 1995. The last one was in Egypt in 2022. And as you know, this is the framework where the Kyoto Protocol um, was in existence until, as you know, now we have the Paris Agreement. And, you know, a lot of people complain about the UNFCCC, but it really is one of the most rigorous, it is the most rigorous place to find um, information that is correct. It's heavily informed by the highly respected 
Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the International Energy Agency. And I think that um, also you might not know, a lot of people are really, uh, they get very frustrated, feeling like at these meetings, not much gets done. But I can tell you, because I've been in these meetings for the past 10 years, that the people that, that are there are working really hard and they really care about the climate. And um, uh, they, well, I lost my train of thought there, but <laughs> sorry, they, um, they're working really hard. They care about the climate. And oh yeah, and, and the reason why it's so hard to get anything done is because in this framework, 100% agreement is required. So it is not it is not a democracy. Imagine getting 197 people in a room to agree on something and they have to get 197 countries to agree. So it's not easy. Here is an example of some really good places to get information on what is going on with the climate and what we need to do about it. Um, so, uh, some of these reports that came out, this one was the special report on global warming of 1.5 that came out in 2018. And then a series of uh, publications are coming out now. They're the sixth assessment report um, from the IPCC. And these really are rigorous. So the 1.5 report was written by 91 scientists by, from 40 countries, and it can only reference peer-reviewed scientific literature, and it has 6,000 of those. And what it came up with is that we need deep emissions reductions, we need rapid and far-reaching and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society, and we're gonna need removal because we're not doing this fast enough. We're gonna need technologies that will take CO2 out of the atmosphere. Um, the sixth assessment report was written by 200, 34 scientists from 66 countries with 14,000 scientific references. And the summary, which you can, you can get the summary for policymakers, had to be approved line by line by 195 governments. So you see this is extremely rigorous and a uh, process. And the outcomes of these are that, we, again, we've got to scale up our emissions reductions, we've got to scale up resiliency because already we're going to have the impacts of climate change. And we need to cut global greenhouse gas emissions by in half by 2030. And last time I looked, we were real close to 20, 2030. So we don't have much time and we need action among numerous dimensions. So it, we have an emergency here. Um, as you probably know, if you look just in this inner circle, you'll see that three fourths of the greenhouse gas emissions that we need to cut are coming from energy. But we have other sources as well. Industry like cement, iron and steel, and petrochemicals. We have waste such as in landfills. And then we have agriculture and forestry and land use, which is also a, a large source of our emissions. So it will not be of any surprise to you that most of the mitigation strategies within the IPCC, within the United Nations, are around energy production. And these are the all of the tools in the toolbox for fighting climate change, efficiency and conservation, wind, solar, geothermal power, biomass power, nuclear, fuel switching from say coal to gas, terrestrial sinks and carbon capture and storage. And since the 1.5 report, we now have removals. Removals are gonna be very important and I will talk about those as well a little bit later. So have you seen this wedge? If I was in the room, I'd be able to see your faces and I'd know how familiar, how familiar you are with the wedge. But um, here is the billions of tons of CO2 that's being emitted over time. And what we know is that, you know, emissions are going up and up and up and up. And if we continue the way we are, they're going to continue to go up. But we need them to go down. And so this wedge here in the middle is telling us exactly how we're going to need 
to decrease these emissions. And if you notice another thing about the wedge, it is a wedge. So at the beginning, we start small, but over time, we need to ramp up. So we see that efficiency is gonna be about a third. Um, renewables has to be about a third of the emissions reductions. Fuel switching, nuclear, a little bit of nuclear, CCS at about 9% and other, which I'll be honest, I, I'm not clear on what the other is, but, um, but we need at least 9% of CCS uh, um, in this scenario. Now that's just for energy, okay? When you look at the full role of CCS, um, the, the uh, reasons for CCS are going to be to stop the emissions from fossil fuels while we're transi transitioning to 100% renewables. And as renewables are increasing, to make sure that we have a little bit of fossil fuel in there uh, to give us dispatch dispatchable power when we to support the renewables when they're not working at full capacity. But put CCS on there so we don't have the emissions. Um, there's a lot of talk about uh, hydrogen and CCS can play a role there. And there are some industries like cement, steel and petrochemicals that just inherently, like you can't produce cement without CO2 emissions. And so we will just definitely have to be capturing those emissions because we don't have any other way right now. And CCS also is uh, needed to form the basis for large scale, scale removals such as bioenergy with CCS, which I'll talk more about, and direct air capture with CCS, which is actually basically putting air through a fan and collecting the CO2 directly out of the atmosphere. But again, we are losing our battle against climate change. Um, here's that wedge again. And if you look at where we want to go and you look at where we are, uh, the, the red triangle represents all the things that all the countries have said they're going to do to reduce their emissions. So all the pledges, all the promises, all the plans only take us to about three degrees C and we need to get to two or well below 1.5. So right now we are not doing enough and we need to upscale every technology that we're using needs to be upscaled drastically. So what does that upscale look like for CCS? Well, in 20 years of research and beginning the development, we stored about a gigaton. We are currently storing, we've got about uh, 30, well, about 20 operating projects right now, storing about 0.04 gigatons per year. But according to the IPCC assessments, we need to upscale that by 100 times. We need to be storing four gigatons per year by 2035. And all of the CO2 that is needed to be stored by 2070 is 220 gigatons. And 56% will come from power generation, 31% from industry, and 14% will be needed to do removals. So the, the upscale is needs to be quite large in order to make our targets. Interestingly enough, um, CCS is accepted in the UN. I, I want to kind of give you the, the history on that so you can understand it. Um, a lot of people think that CCS is just a unicorn technology and it doesn't exist, but I think you'll see that actually there's a long history of assess assessing this technology. So in 2001, the United Nations actually invited the IPCC to give us some information on carbon capture and storage. And so in true IPCC fashion, it was written by hundreds of scientific authors and had hundreds of reviewers. And in 2005, the final report was approved. And this report is available to you online. You can find all of these IPCC reports online. Um, so we have this on carbon capture and storage. Um, and then there was a, and it was included in the greenhouse gas inventories for accounting for how you account for emissions. But there was a debate on whether it should be 
included in the mechanism that funds activities for developing countries. And so for five years within the COPS, the inclusion of CCS in that mechanism was debated. They just couldn't come to a decision on it until finally in 2010, um, the host for the COP was Mexico. And they said, okay, this is ridiculous. We're either gonna let it in or we're not gonna let it in, but we're not gonna talk about it anymore. So the country said, okay, that's fine, but we still have questions. We have questions on safety. We have questions on liability and viability. And so they made a workshop happen in Abu Dhabi in 2011, addressing once and for all, all of those, um, all of those issues in a, in a venue where these people could ask questions and really start to talk about it. And then in 2011 at COP17, there was the vote. And the vote was unanimous, of course, because nothing in the COP can go through unless it's unanimous, that CCS would be allowed in the clean development mechanism and would be supported for developing countries to, to do it. So ever since then, we've been at the COPs, um, just inputting technical information and just making sure that, you know, the information is there for the policymakers um, to make decisions. And so there are regulations in place for the safe storage of CO2 in geologic formations. And these multiple regulations and guidelines are to, number one, demonstrate that the CO2 is remaining in the ground ensuring environmental protection, and if it were to leak, account for emissions reductions or loss of emissions reductions. So what is it, how does it work? Well, um, there's many different sources, as I said, where you can capture CO2. So you're gonna use this on a stationary industrial um, facility, uh, and those facilities can be um, natural gas power plants, biomass power plants, coal, or it can be um, gas processing, petrochemicals, cement plants. And what you basically, you put a scrubber on the flue stack, you scrub the CO2 out, you take it to a hub, you compress it, and then you transport it to a geological formation for deep storage, deep in the geolog geological formation. But there's something very wrong with this diagram and there's something very wrong with most of these diagrams and it's scale because we're trying to show all of these different activities in a schematic diagram some of these things could really make you feel nervous about ccs because it's like it looks like you're storing it in a cave you know, two feet below uh, the ground surface. But in reality, a better depiction is something more like this. Um, we will need to be storing the CO2 at least 800 meters depth uh, below the ground surface. And so what happens is it's injected via wells into the pore space of the geologic formation at least 800 meters below the surface. It's stored for tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years and it's trapped by many different um, mechanisms so the co2 goes in the formation has salty water in it to begin with it is then pushed out of the way the co2 is then um, gone in between the little grains where it is trapped by residual trapping or stratigraphic trapping, because once it's in there, it's less dense than the salty water, it will rise up. So it's good to have some kind of a trapping formation above it so that it will, it will not rise any further. Then it will dissolve in the water, become denser, it will sink down, and then it will mineralize, turn into a mineral. So as time goes on, it becomes more and more secure but that's how it's trapped. And in fact, we have a workflow for this. Um, we have to do site selection. So we have to make sure that we're gonna find a place where the CO2 will go in, but that it will stay in. Then we do risk assessments um, we, with modeling to identify any potential unwanted outcomes. 
and we have to get a permit for this. So we have to have a high level of assurance to the regulator. And then we design the project to minimize any potential risk and we monitor it throughout the entire subsurface. And this is something that really doesn't happen for any other subsurface um, industry except for CO2. There's quite rigorous uh, regulations in place. So we monitor in the deep subsurface to make sure that the plume is behaving the way we thought. And then we also monitor in the groundwater, the soils and the biosphere to make sure that no, nothing's happening to the environment. So there really is a lot of monitoring that goes on. Um, currently, there are 26 commercial projects operating around the world and 13 in advanced development and 21 in early development. So it's happening, it's growing. Um, we've had some long running projects. Uh, one of the longest running projects is in Norway. It's stored over 25 million tons uh, 1 million tons per year since 1996. Also in Norway, we have Snovit, which has stored over 10 million tons since 2008. In Canada, we have the Weyburn site, which is storing 3 million tons per year. This is in an EOR setting. Um, so you have to take, you have to account for the fact that there's oil being produced. And so, you know, it's not, there's an accounting there, right? Because you're producing more um, more emissions by producing the oil, but we'll talk more about that as well. And then there's the Sack Rock oil field, which has stored more than 80 million tons. No adverse reactions, no environmental impacts, no leakage um, has happened yet that we've seen. And in fact, because no leakage has happened, how do we study? Because I'm a researcher. How do we study what would happen if it leaked? How do we study how we would monitor it if it leaked? Well, the main approach is actually to make a leak on purpose. So we use controlled releases to study what would happen if it leaked. Um, this is an example of a controlled release experiment in Montana where they actually put a long pipe uh, in the shallow groundwater aquifer, and they bubbled CO2 in it, into it. And then um, scientists from all around the world came and monitored and did their science on that. There's been two done by the UK in the offshore because CO2 can also be stored deep in the sediments in the offshore. And so there's been one done in Scotland and one in deeper water in the North Sea. And so there's been a lot of study on the impacts, which we have been very diligent on. Um, you might think, what's the big deal if CO2 gets into groundwater? Um, well, you just get Perrier, right? Well, no, it's not that simple. What we were concerned about was that you would get a decrease in the pH of the groundwater, and then you would dissolve minerals which would then release heavy metals into the groundwater. And so that's actually the main thing that we've been very concerned about for groundwater. And the second thing is brine, okay? Because we are injecting into salty water, we don't wanna push that salty water up either because if you get too much salt in your groundwater, then it's undrinkable. So those are the groundwater impacts that we've been very concerned about. And in fact, started studying this 15 years ago. And what we did was we put every single scientific approach that we could think of into this. And so we used um, laboratory uh, experiments where we put the actual aquifer material in a beaker and we bubble CO2 through it. We did the shallow controlled releases. We use natural analogs because there's many places in the subsurface where CO2 exists naturally and modeling. And after 10 years of research, we are feeling much better about the potential for metals or impacts into the groundwater. 
um, if it were to happen, what we know now is it's extremely transient. It, um, it doesn't stay that way for very long. And most of the time, if not all of the time, we saw that it was just a small amount of metals and it didn't take the drinking water over the drinking water standards. So that was really great for us to feel better about that because that was the major risk that we were concerned about. What about terrestrial ecosystems? Well, what we found as well is that if we were to have a leak, it would be um, a small spatial area. Here is an example of a natural analog where CO2 is coming up out of the ground. Um, and what we've also found is that because CO2 is in the environment anyway, plants and microbes and things that live in the soil have uptake mechanisms for this. They actually already have mechanisms in place to deal with if there's too much CO2. Um, and so really it's the ones that don't have the well-developed root systems that are gonna be the most vulnerable to, to damage. But then again, what we saw was a really fast um, recovery. Same with if we were to store it below the marine environment, if it were to leak, we found that the bubbles would start rising as bubble plumes of CO2. Then they would partition into the uh, seawater and nitrogen would partition into the bubbles. And so you, those bubbles would actually be nitrogen at a certain depth. Um, that CO2 would dissolve into the brine. It would again, in the, in the seawater, it would go to the bottom as a dense plume. And so the most of the impact would be to the biota that were immobile, that couldn't run away, um, and to really young, um, the larvae of calcifying organisms. But we also saw some, some of the, like the fish and some sea urchins kind of like the bubble streams. I, I don't know why, but they'd hang out in the bubble streams. So there would be some damage, um, but again, we were happy to see that it was transient and um, small, a relatively small impact. Um, some people ask, do we have how, do we have enough space to store it? And we're, if we're going to need to store 220 gigatons, we're going to need eight, and we have about 8,000 to 55,000 gigatons of storage available. So of course, it might not always be in the right place. Um, we might have to, we're going to have to have pipelines. And so, uh, yeah, pipelines are another thing that people are really concerned about. We already have CO2 pipelines for CO, because we've been doing CO2 enhanced oil recovery since 1972. We do have pipelines already. Um, we have about 6,000 kilometers of CO2 pipelines. Most of them have been mining natural accumulations of CO2 from inside the ground. So that would be something that would be different. We would be, instead of using that for um, natural CO2, we could use um, you know, the, the, the anthropogenic CO2 that we capture for EOR. But again, EOR makes more oil, which makes more emissions. So that's just, that's not something that's gonna go on for much longer because we wanna phase away from fossil fuels. For now, it's what makes CO2 storage economic, because if you think about it, and we can talk more about it, CO2 storage is waste disposal. There's nothing economic about it. It's not anything that gives you a product. It's something you have to pay for. So, um, so for the early stages, EOR is what has made it profitable to start doing these demonstration projects. But the assessment is that we would need 80,000 more new kilometers of new pipelines to get to this large scale that I talked about. And for, so you can understand what that scale is. We currently have 800,000 kilometers of hazardous liquid and natural gas pipelines. So that's the trade-off on pipelines. Okay. Um, what about the cost? So the cost, it's very expensive. It's like I said, it's waste disposal. It's not economic at all. It's very costly right now. It's a very large um, scale process. And so we've had like two major projects so far on 
two or three major projects on power. The first was Boundary Dam. That was the first. It was in Canada. And um, as you see, with each deployment, we get lower and lower and lower down the cost curve. Um, because it's a large technology, obviously, it's going to be very costly to implement these, these um, demonstration plants. But the price is coming down. And I think about that. I think about uh, the evolution of solar and um, how it started in 1970, a price of about $106 per watt. If you look at these vertical lines, each vertical line represents a doubling in the capacity that was installed. And so over, what, uh, 50 years of developing solar, we've got it down. It is massively cheap, 38 cents per watt. A great example of how technologies go down the cost, cost curve and yeah, also the innovation the innovation curve as well. Excuse me, doctor, can you confirm that the last slide was dollar, US dollars per metric ton? Yes. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, so thank goodness we didn't say back in the 70s, solar, we don't need it, it's too expensive. I'm really glad we developed it. Um, so already we have some really great innovations in capture. Uh, we've got you know, innovations because we're deploying the technology. And um, so it's interesting when you think about technology development, uh, at first it feels like science fiction <laughs> and everybody's like, why would we even do this? Later, as we go down, it says, okay, it's doable, but it's too expensive. And then all of a sudden it's kind of like, well, okay, maybe it makes sense in certain circumstances until it just becomes routine and no big deal. So hopefully, you know, that's something that, uh, that we can do with CCS. But again, there's pluses and minuses. So I looked at what the International Energy Agency had to say about the expense of carbon capture and storage, and they had, this is what they had to say. Um, high cost ignores the bigger picture. And I have to say that kind of when, when I'm thinking about cost, I feel that way too, the cost of anything. If you realize the what we are standing to lose here with climate change, then all of a sudden cost is not as expensive because we would do whatever it takes to keep our biosphere. Um, I'm not saying it's not important, it's absolutely important, but that's kind of where I'm coming from, the bigger picture. Um, achieving net zero goals is virtually impossible without CCS. We're going to need it. Um, and then you can read down some of those other things. Um, it supports the integration of renewables. It supports us growing renewables in a way that we can make sure to still have power when the renewables are not at capacity. And, you know, again, like I said, costs are falling and all of these other things, but we need policy because there's no, as I said, there's no economic reason. I have to pay for somebody to take my trash away. Like at my house, I pay for the trash truck to come. And sometimes I think that if CO2 were purple, people would wanna pay to get rid of it. <laughs> but because they can't see it and it's not affecting them now, they're, it's probably not worth it to them to, to pay for it. So an analog is acid rain, and I'm coming to the end. How long have I been talking? Oh, I need to come to the end. Okay. Acid rain is an analog. We realized that acid rain was coming from sulfur dioxide, um, coming out of the, the, the flu stack, and we made a cap and trade system. We said you can't pollute using, you can't let sulfur dioxide go into the atmosphere, and look at the change we've made. Um, literally, we've gotten rid of it by putting the scrubbers on and taking the sulfur dioxide, what we call SOX and NOx, out of the flue gas. And what's really interesting is that the scrubber that's used to take the sulfur dioxide out, it's basically the same way we're taking CO2 out. And this is from the Boundary Dam Power Plant. It's a, it's a peer-reviewed scientific literature on all that they learned from the first deployment of that first plant. 
And what they realized is that we have to take the sulfur dioxide out and the particulates out to make this work. So in fact, now to do CCS, we're also taking a lot more of the particulates out. And so it's really making the flu stack more and more, um, you know, less pollutants coming out of that flu stack. So it's, it's making the air quality better. Quickly about removals. So removals are taking CO2 out of the atmosphere because we're not making our targets. And there's a lot of different ones here, but really the main ones that people are talking about and the main ones that are being put into the, the COPS um, are the land-based ecosystem reservoirs that's doing better land um, management, reforestation, reforestation, um, better uh, agricultural technologies and such. And then storing that CO2 in, in soils. That's so important. And the other is the, the technologies that can be uh, done using CCS. Now, for land-based reservoirs, nature-based solutions, we're currently storing, removing two gigatons per year, and the permanence is for about 100 years. And that's because trees die, you have wildfires, um, and also, you know, but so so they're not very permanent. Oh, and you know, you might have a landowner that does farming practices that are really good and then they go away and now those farming practices aren't happening anymore. But the ecological co-benefits, you just can't argue. I mean, they're just phenomenal. We've got to do this. We've got to scale up our nature-based removal solutions. But we also need the bioenergy with CCS and the direct air capture. Currently, they're really not doing much. Like, you know, that direct air capture is basically at the very beginning of its development, but it is rapidly being upscaled. Um, the, the potential, the IPCCs for direct air capture and BECs is five to 40 gigatons per year. And that looks really good to me. And the storage performance is tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years because we know that when we put CO2 in the subsurface, it stays down there. So I'm just coming to the last couple of slides, a couple of little tidbits. I think this is great because, you know, a lot of the rhetoric says just generally, look, every fossil fuel company is doing greenwashing with this. And I thought to myself, well, there should be a way that we make sure that doesn't happen and how do we and how when we say a company is greenwashing how can we really be sure that we are being truthful about that that is really greenwashing and how can we keep fossil fuel companies and other companies you know feet to the flame right to make sure they're really not doing this and i thought these were great principles you can find this again this is an i this is a un thing we have to make sure that they, they are delivering significant near and medium term emissions reductions. And we have to do all these things and we have to require them to do that. Because we can't let the, the you know, greenwashing isn't gonna work either. So the last couple of slides, I'm down to the last slides. There is an analog and that was when we transitioned from the horse to the car. It took about 50 years and it looked a lot like what we're starting to go through now, you know, people were saying all kinds of things and there were a lot of professions that completely disappeared. We went from about 14,000 carriage building businesses to only 90. So, and the, this is interesting, the price of grain plummeted and the US Census Bureau tagged this revolution as one of the main contributing factors to the Great Depression. So, you know, some people were just in the wrong industry at the wrong time. Um, so many jobs were lost, but more jobs were created. So I think this is something for us to consider when we think about the transition, it's not gonna happen overnight. And so my reflections are that we need to realize that this is an emergency. And so, you know, like, I don't want more pipelines personally. I'm not afraid of pipelines, but I don't really want them. But when I realize what's at stake, 
bring them on, bring on the pipelines, bring on the wind farms, bring it on because we have to know what we have at stake. Um, it's an emergency. Don't fall prey to biased rhetoric. We all need to make informed choices and the place to do it is at the IPCC reports and the UNFCCCC because it is a massively rigorous process. We need to keep up the pressure on fossil fuel manufacturers and we need to keep up the pressure for divestment and we need to transition away from fossil fuels, but it's not gonna happen overnight. And whether we have CCS or not, isn't gonna, the fossil fuels don't care. They're either gonna, they're gonna move forward with or without CCS. And so in my view, we need to a double pronged approach where we stop the fossil fuels, but in the meantime, we need to stop the emissions from the fossil fuels. The other thing is that these oil and gas workers are gonna be the ones with, without the job, okay? And their expertise is directly applicable to carbon capture and storage. So we can take these oil and gas workers that are gonna lose their jobs and we can put them on CCS so that we can remove from industry like cement, iron, steel, and then we can also get our, uh, our removals, DAX and BEC. The other thing I think we need to do is, I'm so glad for this, we are gonna have a conversation, that's what we need to do. We need to involve everyone in the conversation. There are calls to keep emitters out of the cops. And I don't know how we solve the problem if we don't involve the industries that are causing the problem. And in my world, their fossil fuel companies and emitters are actually paying for CCS to be developed. So if we can get them to pay to reduce their emissions while they fade away, I think we go for it. That's my own opinion. Involve everyone in the conversation. We're gonna need rapid, far-reaching, unprecedented changes in all aspects of society. Action is required along numerous dimensions. Let's work together and get it done. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. Thank you. I'll Thank stop you, the Catherine. Yes. So we're now into the question period. So there's two ways to do this. You can raise your hand and I'll call on you. Larry's quick on the draw. Um, and then we'll go in order, or you can put your question into the chat. What I would ask you is it, it would be brief because we have about 15 minutes left and that's fine, but we just don't want to have, uh, you know, dominated by one, one or two questions. Let's keep it to a, you know, fairly short. So let's start with a question from Larry. Okay. The Sleitner field, the whole impetus behind it was the government of Norway said you can build Sleitner, but you're, we're going to charge you $50 a ton for all the CO2 you emitted. And so they said, well, we'll just store it instead. And yes. so they stripped all the CO2 out before they shipped the stuff to shore. Absolutely. And, and, and CC, at CCL has advocated putting a price on carbon for a long time. That's basically how we got started. So Oh, how awesome is that? I didn't know that, see? That's basically what we do, is we advocate for putting a price on carbon. I and agree. that includes methane okay. and other gases, too, but carbon. Thank so you. what do you feel about a price on carbon? Would that yes. help? That would help very much, yes, yes. We need, that's what we need. We need policy to be implemented. So that just like it was in, um, in the sulfur dioxide case, we absolutely need a price on carbon. We need somehow, and, and there is something called the carbon take back obligation that you might wanna look up. It's another method um, that people are talking about where you do not allow the industry to do its business until it gets rid of in some way, shape or form the amount of emissions that it's going to emit by doing that activity. So if you're interested, look, at, look it up. It's called a carbon take back obligation. There's a couple of TED talks on it and that's a good one too, but absolutely keep doing what you're doing because we need a price on carbon. Hey, Larry Howe. Yeah, hey, thank you very much for the presentation today. And I also wanted to, I noticed that you had done a, a you were a participant on a panel with Powerhouse Texas 
with the state legislature. Yes. I think it was February 6th. And uh, I really appreciate you doing that as well. What what was your takeaway from that? Do you think it was pretty well received? Well, I do think it was re well received and thank you for being aware of that. Um, it was definitely well received. Um, and, you know, right now there's a lot of people that are on the beginning of the learning curve of CCS, right? It's a very uh, complex thing. It's, it's multidimensional. And I did see a lot of people that are, are right at the beginning of the learning curve, try, trying to get up that learning curve. So it's good that they were there. And it was, a, it was a very good event. And I was glad to be invited. Thank you. Thanks. Right. Stuart? Yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I, I'm going to ask you a question for your uh, geochemical experience. Okay. Um, one of the problems with direct air capture, of course, is how dilute CO2 is in the atmosphere. Yes. And um, there's a group in, in Cambridge in the UK that's actually running experiments now on capturing CO2 out of ocean water because it's much more concentrated in the ocean water. It would then change the equilibrium so more atmospheric CO2 would dissolve in yes. undersaturated ocean environment. Um, do you have any, I mean, what's your impression of that? Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? Because a lot of people see it as we got to keep CO2 out of the atmosphere. But actually, one of the main reasons why we need to keep it out of the atmosphere is to keep it out of the oceans, right? completely. So um, you're right, there's this equilibrium between the uh, atmosphere and the oceans. And so I, I agree with what you're saying. And also to turn it around, think about this. If we take it out of the atmosphere, it's going to degas from the oceans. So we're not actually going to see the PPM in the atmosphere decrease right away. <laughs> So we do need to be like monitoring the oceans as well, I think, <clears throat> but there's that. But what's gonna happen is if the CO2 degasses from the ocean, we're gonna precipitate calcium carbonate. So when CO2 goes in, you buffer it. It's buffered by the dissolution of calcium carbonate. And that is the phytoplankton with calcium carbonate bodies, they're getting dissolved. So they're not surviving. So, um, so it might help, you know, it might help if, if we, if it took in the atmosphere, it might help, you know, deacidify the oceans, but you're absolutely right. There's this equilibrium going on. So we have to be aware of that. Joe, do we have a couple of questions? Yeah, I have my own question and then I'll read out one question that's in the chat. Um, my question is um, based on what you've seen with the progress in CCS, um, and we know that we have an urgent timeline. Um, do we feel that it, it will be able to make a significant impact based on the current pace of its development? Well, that's a, that's a really important question to ask. <clears throat> and so what I can say is that only in the past couple of years, we have seen the pace of development increase massively, okay? And we're really feeling happy about this. And the reason why it is, is because there were tax incentives um, that came online. And these tax incentives are, for, they're the 45Q tax incentives, and they are incentivizing projects to move forward. In my view, that is not sustainable. We, we really don't want the taxpayer to bear the long-term brunt of the cost of this. But what I'm going to say is it has caused massive, like we are so busy. Oh my gosh. We're so busy trying to help countries and companies do this. Um, there, there's a lot of momentum. And what I saw was there was so much momentum in the U.S. that countries such as Canada and the U.K. are starting to get fidgety because all the business wants to come to the U.S. So now they're doing similar things and they're, so I'm seeing a global push. And the main thing I'm seeing that is a problem is a lack of workforce that understands it. 
So I'm teaching professional development courses. I'm talking as much as I can. I'm teaching students. I'm doing, I'm teaching summer schools because we don't have the workforce that we need. And so I guess the, the short answer to that is I'm feeling really good about the, just the recent push that I'm seeing. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, thank I'll you. read out the uh, question that's in the chat now. This is from uh, Nancy. And she says, uh, does it take more energy to do CCS? And so for, for coal power plants, would they have to burn more coal and produce more NOx pollution? Oh, that's interesting. Um, oh, I see what you're saying. Yes. So there is a large en energy penalty right now. Um, for CCS, and it's mostly in the compression phases. It takes a lot of energy to compress that gas. The, um, the uh, slides that I put up on the um, progress that we've made, uh, the net power, if it works, will need zero compression. Um, the other one will need less compression. So yeah, I mean, right now, the energy penalty is terrible. And what good is it if you're gonna use all that energy? Yeah, you're gonna have to burn more, right? So you're right, um, it's not good right now, but it's getting better as well. And for direct air capture, since the stream is so dilute, the only power source that can be used for direct air capture is renewables, because otherwise it would really make no sense. Uh Larry, you've already asked a question. I see Ed's hands raised. Ed? Yes, first off, thank you very much for the great talk, Dr. I've spoken with some of your colleagues, like Tip Meckle. You guys are doing some awesome work there. Really appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Uh, one, I've been in this space for the past couple of years, been uh, part of a company doing some of the uh, site evaluations for sequestration. And nice. I think you're you're quite aware of, and I'd be interested in your perspective, is the permitting, the class six permitting is a real, um, you know, critical path item that across much of the U.S., you know, the EPA is still in charge of that. Primacy is only existing in a couple of states. Um, what, what are your views on, you know, in, in a place like Texas, where we've got such a long, rich history of subsurface work, it, it seems that Texas would be a natural to have primacy and be able to do their own permitting when meanwhile the EPA is taking two to four years to permit a single class six injection well. So I welcome your thoughts on that. You're absolutely right. And um, Texas is moving towards primacy. It's a great idea. We need it. Louisiana is farther down the line than we are. Um, right. And we need primacy and we're working on it. It's been slow going because we too have two regulators in the state and they had to figure out yeah. which one was gonna regulate that. Yeah, so so and, it's uh, the Railroad Commission. So it will be the Railroad Commission. Um, okay. And uh, right now, because of the Biden infrastructure law, which said, which uh, is opening up offshore leases, um, Bohm and Bessie, our, our offshore regulators, are working really hard to get regulations in place for the offshore. And basically, right now, um, in the Texas state waters, we would use Class 6. But they're trying to get uh, the regulations in place for the outer continental shelf. So yeah. the well, regulators are drinking from fire hoses. They're doing a lot of work right now. <laughs> I uh, appreciate, appreciate your perspectives on that. And that, that also seems like an area where the uh, manpower is a challenge. You know, basically uh, yes. those, you know, regulatory agencies still are, I think they're uh, behind the cap capability curve at the moment. Exactly. The applications they're receiving. Yes, I agree. Thank you. Say we, uh, we have time for one more question. Um, Joe, do you think, is it, Larry's okay to ask the next one? Or do you have something? Yes, burning? there's no, there's nothing else in the chat that I see. Okay, so. Larry, yeah. Larry, go ahead. This will be the last question. Okay, I was just going to say, um, most of the world looks at sailing formations for injection, but Texas has a lot of abandoned or depleted reservoirs of oil and gas. Could could they be used? And what and what is the 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 target for Texas in particular? Yeah. Okay. Really great question. And the answer may surprise you. So, um, so what we're seeing is, okay, so the 45Q tax credit 
gives more credit if you store in a saline reservoir than if you store in an EOR reservoir. So what we're seeing is most companies going for the saline reservoirs. However, we also see companies with different risk appetites. So in a depleted field, as you so aptly mentioned, the old wells are the biggest risk factor. So the old wells are going to be the, the most um, risk for a leakage pathway to the surface. The risk for saline storage is that you don't really have the information on the formation. So from the depleted oil and gas field, you've had the production history. You, you know exactly how things go in the subsurface there. When you move down into the saline leg, you're going to have to drill a well or something. You're gonna, you need more information. So those are the two risk, um, risk factors. And we see different companies with different risk appetites. Some companies say, oh, we don't care about the wells. We'll deal with that. We do wells. We'll go here into the depleted field. And other companies say, Let's, we want to as far away from the wells as we can. But in general, we're seeing more companies targeting saline formations. OK, great. Thank you very much. Uh, and Roger, before we go, if we could um, maybe have everyone turn on their cameras so we can take a nice group photo. Perfect. Joe, you, I'll, I'll take that. Yeah, well, everybody good. has their cameras on. Let's give Catherine a... Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you.